Brilliant. So uh, thank you, everyone that's made it here this morning. And uh, welcome to our Thursday morning session on unlocking net zero innovation skills and supply chains. My name's Rebecca Ford. I'm from the University of Strathclyde. And together with Rachel Berry, we have put together an amazing session for you this morning. And actually, to my panelists, here's just a bit of a warning. Rachel has been going around telling everybody that this is going to be the best session of the conference. So the gauntlet has been laid down, and we fully expect uh, to, that to be delivered. Um, but yes, we have four brilliant speakers lined up. We have uh, Karen Turner from the University of Strathclyde, Richard Hanna from Imperial College London, Cara Jenkinson from Ashton, and Kyla Ente from Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative, or BESCO, which is much easier to say. Um, and I'm not going to say any more about them. They're all in your brochure, and their bios are far more eloquently laid out than I can do after the conference dinner last night. Um, the session, we're going to run it. You're not going to hear much more from me. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Professor Karen Turner, who's going to give a 15-minute keynote. After that, each of our panelists will have 10 minutes. And we're going to then follow on with a panel discussion fueled by the questions that I've been told you can all put in to this amazing hybrid technology and I will see it on the uh, on the iPad that I've been given here so we're not going to do questions after each talk please do use the tech put them in and Rachel and I will make sure we come to them for the panel discussion so without further ado I'd like to by the magic of the internet hand over to Karen thank you okay well good morning everybody um I, I take it you can hear me um, well, thanks very much, uh, uh, Becky and, and Rachel, for inviting me along to speak and for accommodating me in doing so remotely. And I'm having somebody manage my slides, so I, I hope that all goes well. So, yeah, th so uh, as the, the keynote, you know, what I thought it might be useful to talk about this morning is, you know, that we're talking about skills and supply chains, but to kind of set this in the context of labour market opportunities, challenges and, and trade-offs, the, the type of thing that, that we're looking at in, in our research. So if I could have the next slide, please. So, um, well, as, as, as Becky said, I'm from the Centre for Energy Policy at Strathclyde. We're a, a multidisciplinary research centre, and our, but our specialty is really doing eco economy-wide scenario analysis and moving a lot more. And you're working with policymakers and, and understanding the type of policy narrative development that we need to get net zero actions um, up and running. And we've cut across a range of, of net zero areas and decarbonisation actions and doing this research and that's around you know kind of energy efficiency electric vehicles carbon capture and storage but we're looking at things now around broader carbon pricing um across that and in our our UCAR project we've got one of the flex fund projects we're, we're focusing much more now on on the wider heat transition question and the sustainability and the equity of that so the next slide please now with our work, we, we, we published a, a, a net zero principles framework that there's a policy brief link at the, at the bottom of this slide. We also published a paper in the, in the journal called Local Economy about this. And really, this is how we frame our research. And I think primarily, you know, this first question that we have here, that the huge challenge is understanding who really pays for things, how and when, and how the gains can be used to balance this. And I mean, this is a complex question because when we talk about who pays, it's not just the direct, do we pay through energy bills, taxation, do firms pay because of the, the knock-on and the indirect impact. So for example, if you have industry pay for all industrial decarbonisation actions, they'll pass on costs through their price, so consumers pay. And you know, our focus here is around jobs. You know, again, depending on who pays, that can have different impacts on labour demand in the market. So, you know, people could lose their jobs and that's another way that they pay for things or they could move to jobs with different quality, different wage rates. So it's really important to understand what all the knock-on implications are. And strongly linked to that, our, our second question is, you know, if, if things are going to be economically and politically and socially feasible as well as technically feasible, we really need to be identifying pathways with net zero that your, the economy is carrying on growing so that our prosperity continues to grow and hopefully we'll start to do so in a more equitable way than we've had so far. So uh, next slide, please. I think labour markets are obviously, they're always a big political concern, but they're obviously a public concern because that's where people get their incomes from and, you know, and how they, they, 
fund living their lives. And so we already see that there's a lot of attention and the opportunities and challenges for the UK labour market. And, we, you know, we've picked out some, some quotes here. You just look at the Green Jobs Task Force. We're identifying the, the large number of jobs that could be identified and, again, what could be called low-carbon businesses in their supply chains and talking about the turnover and the, and the, the value of goods, but highlighting the number of jobs. Then when we look at something like the Treasury's Net Zero Review, there's a recognition there that this isn't just about job creation. It is about jobs in some areas going. And so, for example, you know, they talk about worker productivity, which probably is around a, a number of things. But basically, with a lot of things that need to be done with decarbonisation, if there's more equipment, if there's more of anything required to produce the same output, you're talking about productivity losses. And that is what will drive, even without a regulation, will drive some businesses to go and hopefully other ones to come in. So, you know, what the Treasury are concerned about there is, yes, we're gaining jobs, but we're also going to lose a lot of jobs. And send, so then the tr transition question comes, how do we move people from the industries that are declining? And a lot of the carbon intensive industries have been people on lower incomes. So there are distributional uh, issues coming in. The thing that's not mentioned in that quote, but is always of concern to the Treasury as well is, you know, what, what extent of displacement might you get? And displacement isn't just about, you know, we're using a cleaner fuel, so we're displacing the one that, that was more carbon intensive. It's about, and I'll talk about this quite a bit going on here, is that when we start to have changes in the labour market, if we start to get shifts in wage rates and labour costs going up for firms, you could displace jobs in entirely unrelated sectors simply because of the implications for, for costs. So if you go on to the next slide, please. So here, the, the, this slide, I think, is, is, is really interesting. And I'll credit Jamie Stewart, who's here this morning, for, for filtering all of this out of um, out of the 10-point the, the plan for a green industrial revolution. What I think is really interesting about this is that all over this document, which was the Prime Minister's document uh, last year around a, a green industrial revolution for, for the UK as we, as we transition, you can see there's just jobs all over it. Now, I've not been through this to see exactly, you know, are these jobs all direct jobs? Are they supply chain jobs? Do they take account of displacement and transition? The key thing about this is that jobs are mentioned all over the place and they're, they're mentioned in large numbers. They're linked to the, to the carbon savings. They're linked to value added and investment. So this is very much an economic picture, but emphasizing the need to transition and create jobs. So it's obviously very important in terms of the political economy narrative that, that, uh, that, that jobs are, are, are put at the forefront here. But if you go on to the next slide, please. One of the areas that we've done work is, is, is around energy efficiency, particularly in the residential se uh, sector. And, you know, what's interesting about a lot of the jobs that we can create, people will quite rightly argue that some of them will be transitory because they will be enabling a net zero action. But energy efficiency, the, 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 le the length of time that we might create jobs for is interesting for a couple of reasons. When we went about this research, you know, we were looking at what are the gains of having longer term uh, and retrofitting programs. And the, the first thing that is of concern there is that businesses for supply chains to build up and businesses to build up around things like retrofit and other net zero actions, they, they, they need to know that it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a sustainable business proposition that there's going to be sufficient projects to justify the kind of investment. So we, we looked at this, our initial focus was, is there be enough being announced in terms of the ambition and the scale of, of the retrofitting programs that businesses will actually get behind it and create the jobs. But I think the other thing is that when we talk about a lot of jobs being transitory in the net zero space, when you've got something, the scale of what we need to do with energy efficiency, and you're talking about 15 year programs, that's a little bit less than transitory. 15 years is a, is a, a fair chunk in people's, in people's careers. So that there's a couple of reasons why that's really important. So we, in this piece of work, which we've got a policy brief here that you can see, but we've also you know, published a few things in journals. We're looking at you know, what is the pathway of the economic development and the job creation that goes on. And if you go on to the next slide, please. This is, this is 
our, our, our results where we were looking just at year one. And, you know, what's interesting here is you see this, this big upward spike. That's in the construction sector. So within the wider UK construction sector, this is where a lot of the retrofitting work is going on. That's where the firms that are, that are doing the work and delivering retrofit projects belong. And, you know, the key thing was that we were identifying that over 100,000 full-time equivalents uh, construction jobs may be needed to service. And we looked at different uh, speeds of action and energy efficiency. But if you went early, you know, we need to get a lot of the, 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 the maybe up to 50% done in the next few years. Early action, that's the, the level of job creation that you could be looking at. But it's also, that might be the, the labour demand, but how are you going to service it? Do you have the skills and things like that? So there, there's big implications in the scale and nature of the labour demand. And so obviously this is a, a significant opportunity. But I think one key thing here is, is, is the constraints that we have on labour supply in the UK. And one issue is whether or not you're going to be able to deliver those jobs. Uh, you, or, or is there going to be a barrier in that there's just not enough people to service the projects working? But the other thing is if you have a look along at the, the right-hand side, you'll see that I'm having job losses here in the results. And the key thing here is that You've got a constrained labour market. You need to do something very quickly. So labour demand shifts. If that starts to put upward pressure and wages in the economy, then totally unrelated sectors can be displaced. And the ones where we're seeing some losses here in the first year is that the, the unrelated industries that are service industries, they're labour intensive industries. So if the wage rate gets pushed up in the economy, you can start displacing some activity in these uh, uh, can unrelated but labour intensive sectors. So if you move on to the next slide, please. This is the kind of results that we were getting for over the long run. And what's really interesting here is that when we're talking about the jobs that are sustained over the long term, we're no longer talking about jobs that are dominated by the construction sector. What we're talking about here is that as households become more energy efficient, hopefully then they start to save money in their energy bills, they've got more money to spend. So the sectors that ultimately grow in the economy are the ones where consumers spend their money. So that's where you could start to see recovery for a lot of these service sectors. But again, what's the impact on wage rates and what activity might be getting displaced across the economy? This is the wider picture we need to look at. If you go on to the next slide, please. This was another case that we looked at where you're talking about kind of enabling work, infrastructure development. And we were looking here at, at to, to create the capacity for uh, CO2 transport and storage in the carbon capture and storage uh, uh, space. And again, this is us looking at the, the not so much the year term, but we were looking at uh, the, the, not just the first year, the first few years. So again, with the type of, across the industrial clusters, the type of accelerated CCS activity we were talking about, that could require up to 60,000 construction jobs. But again, there are implications for other sectors. CCS is complicated because, you know, who's going to pay for it? You might end up having some displacement if you have a, a very industry-focused uh, 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 approach to, to paying for all of this and you know you, you maybe risk loss in competitiveness so you could actually end up losing some jobs in the capture industries that you're trying to service just because they're bearing additional costs but again if you look where are the jobs losses along in this right hand side of our chart where you have a lot of the service industries and again just picking out what happens here and I think that, that we put together this chart not just in the context of the CCS if you're watching the news every night at the moment, these are the concerns that are starting to rise. You know, here we had the, because there's competition over workers, the main, the major that's really going to get affected is when you've got bargaining in the labour market, what workers are concerned about is their real wage rate. That's why you see in the news, you know, workers at the moment being concerned about getting offered 4.5 or 5% when the rate of inflation is at 10%. Because if their real wage rate, if their nominal wage increase is less than what the, 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 the CPI or inflation is at the moment, that means their real wage is going to drop. Now, that's not what we've got here. We do have real wages rising. But basically, when people are bargaining to, you know, that if 
unemployment is dropping, labour demand is rising, workers will try to, to, to bargain over their wage. And that's when you've got competition in the labour market. That translates through to nominal wage increases for what the producers actually have to pay. And that's where you're starting to get a drive in consumer price pressure. So feeding through to inflationary processes. Here we do still end up with a net increase in the real wage. And you get a real trade-off here because we want people's real wages to grow. You know, the government talks about we want, you know, kind of more jobs, we want higher real wages. But the problem is that when you start to trigger inflationary processes, that will increase the, the cost of living. And we get the kind of challenges that people are talking about now. But in terms of the displacement of labour, the fact that wages are being bid up, that's another source of displacing workers in the net zero transition, just like in any growth process that isn't limited to just one industry replacing another. So if you go into the next slide, please. So you can see this is this has been discussed kind of widely at the moment in the media and in and, uh, government consultations. So the Business Energy Industrial Strategy Committee, they've launched an inquiry into looking at labor, UK labour markets, because obviously we know we have very constrained labour supply. We know that the supply constraints we've got in our labour market have been increased since, since Brexit. And again, that's seen as a positive and, you know, kind of in that political standing is that we're raising real wages for our workers, but that's through having more labour market competition. That has implications then, you know, we've got this headline, skill shortages could undo the UK government's net zero plans. Well, they're talking about, a, having enough skilled workers coming in, but then there, there will be competition over those skilled workers. And, you know, we were talking to people who are in the the the, the, the phase one of the, the, the CCS rollout and they're saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody made a very clear point that another project or firm could offer an extra 50 pence an hour to workers and those workers might move. So it's, it's a highly kind of dynamic labour market that you've got and where wages are getting, where wages are going up, that has cost implications for the economy and it's also opportunities for work, workers. So it really is a trade-off. And the second headline that we've got here is that more construction workers are undoubtedly going to be needed to service all these net zero projects. And that might be the kind of epicentre of some of the competition that we've got going on in the wage pressure. But as our results just showed, once you start to push up wage rates, that will push out across the wider economy. And so that's why the, this third headline, just generally talking about a shortage of workers, this labour supply constraint threatening the UK recovery, is both being able to do the projects and what the cost will be and what the implications are for other sectors. So if you go on to the next slide, please, this is kind of our, uh, you know, kind of a bit of analysis that, that, that Jamie and I were setting out based on, uh, on all of the work that we've been doing at, at, at the centre. And I think, you know, in the green boxes, we've got our drivers, you know, and the core one here is the fact that in the UK, like many countries, but particularly in the UK now, we've got a, a, either labour supply, you'd consider it fixed, or at least you would say it's highly constrained. What can you do about that? Well, you can try and encourage greater full-time participation in the labour market. You know, this is something that irks me, you know, we constantly hear about how our unemployment rates are low, but there's obvious issues around who, who is classed as unemployed. But if you measure this in full-time equivalent terms, somebody can be employed, but they're only working 10 hours a week. Do they want to work more? You know, they wouldn't be formally classed as unemployed, but they might have more hours that they want to give. If you're really stretched or you should be doing this anyway, but, but if, if there's an issue over the number of workers, the headcount, well, what, is, what can you do? Well, if you can increase the productivity of workers or labour efficiency, you then increase your effective labour supply so you can deliver more output. So that's something that we need to always think about is improving labour productivity. The other one is, which wouldn't perhaps go down politically well in some, in some parts of the country, inward migration. I mean, that's, you know, when we look at Scotland as a regional economy, if we need more workers, we hopefully pull them away from the rest of the UK. The next level down, the other driver you've got is that coming from the fact that you've got labour supply constraint, but generally just because there's so much going on around net zero, you've got competition between sectors and projects for appropriate skilled, appropriately skilled labour. What do you do about that? Well, obviously targeting skills development and looking at how do you, so you don't get frictional unemployment, how do you get people to be able to move easily from one job in one area and other 
uh, to another. This isn't uh, this isn't getting over the overall labour supply constraint, but the more flexible and, and mobile you can make workers and, and the transitioning of skills, transferable skills and things, the better. But what it really comes down to is I think there's real policy challenge and trade-off is we know and what we're showing in our results when we do our economy-wide analysis that real wage bargaining in labour markets pushes up production costs, which will then feed through to prices in the CPI. And I think people really understand that at the moment with what's happening with inflation and the cost of living, which of course is really accentuated at the moment with what's going on uh, at, at, in, in a, in a in the global context as well as uh, at a UK level. But this is a real welfare trade-off because as I said earlier, we want people to earn higher real wages. We just don't want that to bring cost of living pressures. So again, we come back to productivity gains as part of the answer to this, but we need to understand what's going on in labour markets and the fact that activity can be displaced. So next slide, please. So we, we've done some work and I think we're going to return to this uh, as perhaps publish a policy paper here. But I think we need to understand when we're talking about net zero, we're talking about, we call it green growth, but at the end of the day, it's like any growth process. So we need to analyze it in that way. So first of all, when we're looking to reduce carbon emissions to meet our net zero targets, we're inevitably going to have new costs that are coming in. These costs must be recovered. That will have implications for household budgets, whether it's through energy bills or through taxation and things like that. You can, you know, as people have talked about with the energy price shock and, and it, oh, if only we'd done energy efficiency action earlier, the more efficient you can be in the use of things, the more you mitigate the impact of increased costs. The second one, and a lot of what I've been talking about here this morning, is that green growth opportunities and green jobs opportunities, they clearly do exist and they can start to help offset and redistribute the impacts. The, but we need to recognise that growing jobs and growing the economy, whether it's green or not, that will bring price pressures, particularly where we have a labour supply constraint. And we have to manage these trade-offs between growing people's real wages and real incomes and potentially overheating the economy where we've got price pressure. And I think the third point is it all comes back to you're going to maximise your opportunities and your growth in jobs and in GDP and things like that where people can learn to use new technologies more efficiently and we can generally start to build productivity gains. So productivity has been a core focus of economic policy for a long time. It needs to become a core focus of green growth policy as well. So on to the final slide, please. I think the three main points that I would ask you to take out of this is yes, net zero activity can create green jobs. And this is in a range of existing and emerging sectors. Uh, and this can help balance declines where we have to have declines. The second thing is that policymakers really need to understand net impacts. So yes, we need to understand what all the opportunities for green jobs are and things like that, but these are the gross side. We need to understand the net impacts when we're looking at people transitioning out of different one job into another and where there might be real trade-offs from real wage growth. And so attention really needs to focus on what type of factors, you know, like I had in that little step chart, might be needed to mitigate our labour supply and displacement issues, because this is what's ultimately going to allow us to meet both the short and medium term needs. So things like getting retrofitting activity going and energy efficiency, getting heat pumps out, but ultimately realising sustainable long-term economic benefits so that we know when we get to 2050, we're going to have a healthy economy where people can earn a living and government can generate the revenues that it needs to deliver all the public services that, that we want as well. So um, I apologies if I've been a little bit over the 15 minutes, but I, I, get so, it's, I get so enthusiastic when I talk about this stuff. So I look forward to joining the group discussion as much as I can. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. And I think you laid out some really interesting challenges there, especially around the whole system, whole sector, whole economy perspectives. Um, we've got three panelists now who are going to bring very unique and important perspectives on some of these big picture issues. So, um, so first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Hanna. Can we get the slides? 
Oh, thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> Yeah, hi. So um, I'm going to follow on from um, what Karen was talking about um, in relation to both job creation, but focusing more on some implications for supply chains and skills in, in low carbon heat and energy efficiency. Um, this this um, is, is, is based on, on work that I've carried out at Imperial College London for UKIRK. Um, in relation to various projects over the last few years. So, um, well, th th this year I, I actually published a report on green job creation um, for UKIRK um, and also a report on the future of home heating, which was focusing on particularly on the role of heat pumps and hydrogen in decarbonising heat in, in residential buildings. And then also, yeah, in the last, last several years, um, I've, I've been involved in various reviews of international evidence of um, policies supporting heat decarbonisation, particularly in different European countries. And again, that research has been carried out for, for UKIRK. Um, in relation to that, this, this chart shows kind of fuel share for residential, non-residential heating demand in various countries. Um, and the key point here is that, as, as you're probably aware, the UK is very heavily dependent on, on natural gas for, for heating, second only to the, to the Netherlands in, in, in the chart there. Um, and obviously this is in, in kind of key, this is in stark contrast to some of the Scandinavian countries, um, such as Sweden, Nor Norway and, and Finland, that um, utilise a lot of district heating or or heat pumps or, or even, even, even biomass for, for their heating supply. Um, and, and, and generally, um, I mean, Karen's very, um, in, in, in great detail, covered the sort of economic aspects and the implications of job creation. But um, in, in our own review, um, we did actually uh, compare employment multipliers across various studies um, for um, renewables and energy efficiency compared to um, fossil fuel technologies such as coal, gas, oil. Um, and this particular chart shows the number of jobs um, created per million pounds invested. Um, the currency has been converted from the original kind of currencies in, in, in the studies, whether those be in, in, in dollars or, or euros. And this generally shows that or it suggests that um, renewables or energy efficiency, at least in gross terms, can create more jobs than, than, than fossil fuels. Um, and in terms of net, it suggests that there can be sort of a, a level of net job creation there as well. Um, these employment multipliers do kind of vary in terms of whether they include um, direct jobs created directly as a result of an investment or indirect jobs created in the wider supply chain, or in some cases, they include estimates of increased household expenditure as, as, as a result of um, workers for whom jobs have been created spending more money in the economy. Um, but then there's also a, a, a regional, local dimension, of course, to job creation. So this table, without going too much into detail, shows various estimates of how um, jobs and job creation might be distributed regionally. So the first column is actually the um, direct jobs estimated by the Office for National St Statistics. Um, but the second column is study by local government associations. So it um, shows the number of jobs that may be required, direct jobs that may be required in the low carbon and renewable energy economy, including energy efficiency, um, by 2050 to support net zero. Um, and these are just, as I say, direct jobs and there's over a million that would be required by 2050. Um, and then National Grid also estimated um, energy generation and network jobs, so jobs in operating and maintaining um, energy networks also required for, for net zero of the order of 400,000 in the UK. Um, and last two columns is quite interesting because, again, separate studies, but the Energy Efficiency Infrastructure Group um, estimated the number of annual jobs that would be required to upgrade all homes to energy performance certificate rating C by 2030. Um, and, and, and obviously in, in, in terms of planning for 
um, job creation and job displacement. The final column there is a study from um, the Web, Web et al. 2020 shows jobs displaced from uh, transition away from, from, from gas, gas heating. So just really to make the point that we need to be mindful of the um, regional and local balance of job gains and, and losses. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of finish up by talking about um, some of the policy implications and requirements for expanding skills and supply chains. So I think, as, as, as was covered quite a lot yesterday, there's very definitely, particularly in the area of heat decarbonisation and energy efficiency, a need for clearer and, and more, more stable and consistent national policy support. So current government targets for heat decarbonisation are still too, too vague and lack clarity. Um, of course, there's been problems with various schemes, um, such as zero carbon homes or the Green Homes Grant more recently being introduced and then scrapped. Um, and financial incentives for, for, for heat pumps, for example, have been very sort of stop start and the current boiler upgrade scheme is, um, would only actually support in terms of funding around 90,000 air source heat pumps or equivalent. Um, and yeah, building energy efficiency, as the point was made many times yesterday about the uh, bad state of the UK's housing stock. And so, yeah, comprehensive improvements are urgently needed and beneficial regard regardless of the low carbon heating technologies that, that we would install. Um, but heat demand cannot be completely eliminated, so, so we're still going to need some combination of heat pumps, district heating, possibly low carbon hydrogen. In terms of skills and training, um, this would need to be scaled up substantially to support a low carbon heating transition. So um, there's around 140,000 plumbers and heating ventilators ventilation engineers in the UK and over 2 million workers in, in construction, but only um, 20,000 workers in, in, in low carbon heats in terms of direct jobs and wider supply chain. So there's significant shortages of skilled workers in heat pump installation and maintenance. Um, gas installers don't currently have necessary skills to, to install hydrogen boilers. Um, in terms of heat pump supply chain, um, there's only kind of around 265,000 heat pumps in the, in the UK at, at the moment and the Committee on Climate Change has estimated that um, around 17 to 19 million homes would need heat pumps to meet net, net zero. Um, this compares to say other countries such as France, Sweden and Germany which have heat pumps installed in the order of um, a few million. Um, another issue is that there's only around 2,000 heat pump installers and maintenance workers in the UK um, compared to 130,000 gas safe engineers um, and there's only several domestic manufacturers um, in the UK as well. Um, so recommendations on developing supply chains for heat pumps, so the sort of general policy recommendations around there is a need for, for longer term and more ambitious grants with greater funding support. But also, in, in given the sort of cost of living crisis and the gas price crisis, um, governments should support schemes which um, provide access to affordable finance. Um, and yeah, I mean, there needs to be a more sort of coordinated strategy for supporting UK heat pump manufacturing. Um, through, say, policy support and incentives for UK-based manufacturers to shift um, or diversify production to, to heat pumps. But there are a number of policy initiatives un, un, underway shown in the bullets there. Um, also, I, I think an investment in national research and testing and training facility for heat pumps would, would, would help to develop the technology further. And generally, there needs to be a more sufficiently coordinated strategy to address many of the skill shortages on the UK's path to net, net, net zero. And it's been estimated around 50,000 qualified installers would be needed to deploy 1 million heat pumps by 2030. And then final slide um, on, on, on energy efficiency. So in, around, in, in the UK, around 90 million homes are rated EPCD or, or, or worse. Um, and as, as mentioned in other, other pres presentations, there's, there's, there's no funding, there's no funding announced for wide-scale incentive schemes in the UK's energy security strategy 
and it's in, in, in stark contrast to say what's happening in, in the Netherlands where um, the government allocated 4 billion euros to insulate 1.5 million of the least energy efficient homes by 2030. And, and, and again, there needs to be a sort of na national strategy and delivery programme for low carbon heat and energy efficiency, which in turn needs to be coordinated with, with local area energy planning to map heat demand and choose most suitable heat technologies, but also um, this combined sort of national and local strategy needs to support um, development of supply chain and skills in, 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 in low carbon heat and energy efficiency, given particularly the fragmented nature of the buildings and construction industry. And there are other issues that need to be addressed around ageing workforce and lack of diversity in the construction sector as, as well. And I'll, I'll finish there. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Richard. And, um, and if you like that, the, the full report is on the UKIRK website, isn't it? And I 100% suggest you download it and read it because it's really brilliant. Um, and please do remember as well to get your questions into the online platform so we can pull them up for the panel discussion. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Cara. Thank you. Right, just make sure I can move the slides. Someone just go on to the next slide, please. It's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> okay, what I might do is just start talking and then wait for the um, slides to appear, if that's okay. Um, so, um, I'm Cara Jenkinson uh, from Ashton. Um, and um, I'm going to be talking about green skills today. Uh, it's a huge topic, so I'm going to focus on a particular area, which is the local dimension to uh, the building of green skills and looking how councils, colleges and employers uh, can work together to develop uh, uh, skills. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction to Ashton. Uh, I'm going to then uh, give you some highlights of a report that we commissioned along with Friends of the Earth into uh, what councils can do uh, on green skills. I'm going to look a bit more at some of the challenges uh, and then I'm going to give some examples of innovative organisations that are tackling the challenge. Um, so, Ashton is a climate solutions charity. Uh, we've been um, awarding innovative organisations taking climate action both in the UK and in the developing world for uh, 20 years now. Uh, and we have an alumni base in the UK of around 100 organisations across sustainable energy, uh, sustainable buildings, uh, transport, a number of other themes. Uh, we actually have a focus over the next three years on green uh, jobs and skills, uh, so our awards are focused on that. And we've also been working a lot over the last four years with local authorities uh, on climate action and our approach is very much underpinned by uh, co-benefits, uh, warmer homes, better health and of course good green jobs. Uh, and uh, we've produced a number of resources for local authorities to help them develop and deliver their, uh, their action plans. Any luck with the slides at all? Two seconds. All right, I will carry on and we will imagine that the slides are there. Um, okay, so um, yeah, one other thing we've been doing uh, worth mentioning with local councils is we've been running a set of regional uh, learning uh, workshops, networks uh, around retrofit, green procurement uh, and uh, uh, community engagement on climate action and those are taking place in London, in the northeast and in the southwest. Uh, so we believe that local authorities should be at the heart of the place-based approach to green skills development, uh, which is why we were really pleased to commission the report I just mentioned with Friends of the Earth um, on the actions that councils can take right now. Um, and the report authors consulted with local authorities, with local enterprise partnerships, uh, with young people through Teach for the Future uh, project, and also with a really inspirational organisation called Voyage Youth, which works with young black people in East London. Um, so the report starts off um, with a description of what is a green job. And in fact, you'll find that all uh, reports on green jobs start off with that d debate about what they are. Um, and uh, so really, the, we, we uh, did a nice graphic, which we'll imagine, uh, which shows um, 
Uh, okay, are we move. No. Um, so, so basically uh, moves from uh, the kind of deep green jobs that are specifically in ecology and sustainability to right through to those jobs that are really in kind of harm, that are directly harmful to the environment and are going to be difficult to, to, to reshape. Um, and uh, one of the um, people that we spoke to uh, from a mayoral combined authority uh, made the point, she said, green jobs should not be treated separately from generic jobs. All jobs in the future will need to have a green element. And uh, and I think um, uh, yeah, whether that there were kind of obvious jobs like you know, uh, plumbers to, to, to heat pump installers, as, as Richard has discussed, uh, but those that are less obvious, so, so lawyer, lawyer to um, uh, environmental lawyer, uh, accountant to carbon accountant. So all jobs are going to change. Um, the next point that came out was around diversity. Uh, there is a real lack of diversity in the environmental sector. Estimates from uh, policy exchange saying 3.5%, just 3.5%. Um, right, I think we are back on, so let me see. Uh, so that, there are some of our Ashton winners. Uh, lots of case studies for research uh, uh, on our website. Uh, that's our local authority work. This is the report uh, that I'm talking about now uh, with, Fre with Friends of the Earth. Uh, that is the nice slide with the green jobs. Um, and this, so um, this is a slide actually from the West of England Combined Authority, and it shows you know, those kind of how jobs, all jobs, are changing um, uh, uh, to, to, to incorporate that green element. Uh, and then the point about diversity, so uh, three point, just 3.5% 3 in that report. And we actually had a round table with Voyage Youth where we had around 12 young black people. We talked about green jobs and there was a real lack of awareness of what the study pathways were to get into a green job. Uh, lack of guidance and support, lack of role models that, that, that look like them, lack of mentors. Um, and uh, uh, influencing career pathways. So, so some real issues to address there. Okay, so um, we, uh, the report came up with six recommendations. Um, the first is that geography matters, uh, so picking the right uh, geographic area for, um, uh, for action. Uh, that recommendation also uh, alludes to the key levers uh, for action uh, that local authorities can take, uh, importantly through procurement uh, and embedding green skills development in procurement, uh, perhaps through use of, low, uh, of social value uh, um, tools. Um, and uh, yeah, and also uh, really leveraging the adult education budget um, uh, uh, as well. Uh, we talked about diversity, um, so the, the councils should work with grassroots organisations on the ground to put role model uh, programmes in place and also work with local employers to encourage internships, work experience uh, for people from different uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, publishing an evidence base to see where the gaps are uh, and where they need to be filled and perhaps to set up a local green task force bringing together local universities, businesses uh, uh, and other institutions to, to, to bring that action plan together. Um, and then I think this is an important one about strengthening the council's own skills. So, uh, and that needs to go not just in the, in the low carbon department, but across procurement, legal, finance, otherwise uh, uh, we won't get this right. Uh, and again, there are real opportunities to, to learn from local universities uh, uh, and, and businesses in the community. And then the, the, the fifth recommendation is about stimulating demand. So uh, you know, local authorities can work with anchor institutions, businesses, colleges to go for joint projects, joint funding bids. Um, and then those partnerships can bring uh, greater buying power and the ability then to, uh, to insist on green, uh, green skills and green jobs creation as part of that. Um, and then final recommendation is really about taking advantage of all and any funding opportunities that there are out there, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so just to look a bit more into some of the uh, opportunities and challenges. So as everyone else has alluded to, the biggest challenge is the lack of long-term government policy. Um, a huge gap in skilled craft workers. Uh, um, we've, we've heard about uh, retrofit and construction from everyone else. Uh, there are also problems in other areas such as forestry, uh, lack of people to maintain trees uh, once we've planted them all. 
um, uh, apprenticeship standards and qualifications can be slow to change and the organisations shaping them are often the big businesses who do things in the big business as usual way. So in, in construction, it's the big volume house builders and they don't know about retrofit. So there, there, there are issues there. Uh, lack, real lack of trained instructors in FE colleges. Uh, uh, particular issues for small medium uh, businesses uh, who don't have the uh, time resource to get trained and, and, more, and difficult for them to take on apprentices. Most apprenticeships are now with big companies. Uh, so what are the opportunities? So there's the shared prosperity funding, that's the new funding stream that replaces uh, various EU funds. Uh, which are, uh, is being allocated uh, to, to local authorities. Uh, a lot of um, uh, authorities are now putting their, their bids together. There is government funding for retrofit for those on low, uh, uh, on low income, around six, uh, six billion being put in there, and that creates opportunities through procurement to, to, to insist on uh, development of, uh, of green skills. Uh, and that, as I mentioned, yeah, using social value properly in procurement, not as a tick box, but really making sure that there is uh, skills development there. Um, there is additional funding uh, for colleges now after uh, years of neglect. Um, and there are colleges that are working with employers really to ramp up their skills. Uh, um, uh, and then, uh, uh, as mentioned, combined authorities are doing some really good work in this area, London and Manchester, developing green skills academies and the others will be following. Uh, and, and the government's green uh, skills boot camps are also an opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to quickly whip through some examples. Um, so uh, Portsmouth, the uh, city of Portsmouth have just launched a, a groundbreaking net zero training hub um, and that's with the council, the, co uh, um, the college and employers. Uh, it looks um, really impressive but uh, all of this stuff is early days. Uh, Mid Kent College, uh, they are about to launch um, a, uh, a zero carbon learning factory and home energy centre. Uh, looking at retrofit, uh, heat pumps, uh, but also looking at grey water. That's a real issue in, in South East England with water shortage. Um, so uh, I mentioned that Ashton is doing a low carbon skills award this year. Uh, Manchester, very well represented. Uh, B for Box, if you've not heard of them, really worth looking at. Uh, they are a construction uh, company, but they are also a social venture and they specialise in getting the hard to reach people who have been out of employment for a while into employment. And, and, and as Karen said, it's that five million. How many of that five million can you get into employment? So they're, they're interesting. Northwest Skills Academy, big retrofit skills training program, uh, hundreds being trained here in, in, in Manchester. Different project, Black Mountains College, that's all about forestry, uh, training on uh, greenwood uh, um, and coppicing. And that's a really interesting partnership with a college, uh, a, a group of colleges. They, um, Black Mountains have the space, they have the skilled instructors, the college group do the accreditation and the quality control. Uh, and a couple of examples from York, uh, Passive House, uh, they're, they're doing a lot of Passive House development and they are using their Passive House contractors to train, working with the local college to start training the instructors there, so nice partnership. Waltham Forest, working with business uh, to get uh, a, 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 an electric vehicle charging uh, course uh, for electricians to, to upskill. And finally, uh, repowering. Uh, this is uh, Ashton Winner repowering, uh, and they have put solar on the roofs of various community buildings, and they have provided over the last year or two um, 16 uh, uh, traineeships for uh, paid, importantly, uh, for for um, uh, local community. Um, and that's it. Um, uh, just to say that in order for that to scale up, that has to, you know, we really have to scale up that good work. We need uh, a better government policy. We need that commitment to green skills development. Amazing. Thank you so much, Cara, especially with all those technical challenges and you just glided through it was brilliant so i'd like to welcome our final speaker up this morning <laughs> kayla please come and join us and uh, and after this we'll go to our panel discussion so please get your questions in there okay great super i have the luxury of being the last so i can <laughs> go through everything that everyone else has done uh, my name is Kayla Enti. I'm the founder and chief executive of Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative. And we're a social enterprise that I set up back in 2013 to address all of the um, issues that we saw 
well, that I saw in the energy industry. And we're quite unique for a community energy group because uh, we're structured as a social enterprise and we work with the local community, but we, almost, we work a lot like a company would work, um, although we have a very participative uh, structure. So there's nine of us now at uh, BESCO, uh, I'll say for short, and uh, we're focusing on bringing, taking people through the journey to, um, to net zero. And so we're on the ground, we've, we've worked in three different rural communities to decarbonize heat, and we deliberately selected rural communities because of, although they're only 15%, it's still two and a half million people, um, and they have the highest carbon footprint, as well as the most volatility in terms of heat. So we thought, okay, we've got a great combination of economic challenge, environmental challenge, let's go in and work with these communities. So um, we got RCEF, uh, Rural Community Energy Fund money, and we went into those communities. And so I can really talk about what it's like to engage with people, bringing up some of the challenges that Karen um, discussed in her presentation. A lot of it is about perception. Um, people don't trust the energy industry. That was one of the drivers for setting up a, a social enterprise in the energy industry so we can engender trust and show a different way of not selling energy as a commodity, but selling it as a service. And so that's what we are. We're an energy services uh, provider. Can we go to the next next slide? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, and so I've been in this industry now for 25 years. Um, and I started in renewable energy when it was very expensive and completely uneconomical to do anything with solar panels. Um, and I worked on wind farm development. I was living in, in, uh, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And um, so, my background is in finance and economics. I used to work for EY, and I'm a qualified accountant. And so the big barriers, if you're going to look at an industry, what do you need to tackle? The two things for renewable energy are cost, the upfront cost, and the technical fear that people have that the technology will not deliver in accordance with their expectation, that renewable heat, heat pumps are not going to deliver the same quality heat as uh, fossil fuels. And in many ways, that is true because uh, when you have a heat pump, it delivers lower temperatures. And so you need to make sure that the building envelope is going to retain that heat. So you cannot look at energy efficiency and renewable heat independently. It's all one thing. You've got to ensure that you do the energy efficiency measures. And so when we talk about skilling up, um, and looking at the size of this market, my estimate is that it's a one trillion pound market for energy efficiency. If we have 19 million homes that we need to upgrade um, right now, then we're talking about a huge, huge market. Um, and so what we do is we raise money in the local community. Uh, we, f for no upfront cost, we will install renewable energy and energy efficiency, which has a discernible economic value because either you're saving kilowatt hours or you're generating kilowatt hours basically for free from the sun or, or um, from uh, the measures that you've installed. We'll enter into some kind of financial agreement. So either you're buying uh, the solar power from us at a lower rate, so we build in uh, savings from the start, um, or you, we enter into a heat supply agreement where you're buying the renewable heat for, from us. We install all the infrastructure for you, and you just pay us uh, a lower rate for that heat that's um, generated. We do all the um, maintenance, and we monitor it remotely so that you're sure that we're on top of it and that it's delivering in accordance with the expectation. There's a, a lot of fear in the market around solar. A lot of people who contact us, their solar panels aren't delivering what the installer said. Um, so this way, people are assured that they're getting what they paid for, which um, brings a lot of assurance into the market. Can we have the next slide? Oh, okay, great. Super cool. So, um, let's see. Yeah. 
So when we talk about policy uncertainty, it's incredible what we've gone through uh, in the past seven years uh, in terms of complete decimation of the market through government policy. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to stand by and watch um, what government policy has done, especially to, for, for example, in Brighton and Hove, we used to have 10 independent companies that would install insulation. Now we have to go to Stenning, which is outside uh, the city, to find one, and then the next one is in Southampton. It's really a big problem to find installers, and that's because of the boom and bust policies uh, that happened in association with the Green Deal um, and over prescriptive government policy making. Oh my God. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this, it, this is the impact. You can see that in 2012, we, we were insulating lofts, there were a lot of businesses. Uh, this is pretty much when I started BESCO in 2012. Uh, and then we've just had a continual deterioration um, that's happened in the industry. Uh, and the same is we're seeing a, a, a surge in materials costs. So we're seeing that the barriers to taking action, um, and a lot of people are extremely hesitant to invest in the energy efficiency of their homes. Um, in the communities that we're talking to, they don't want the disruption, they don't want the dust, they, don't, they think that that's not the way they want to spend their money. The, um, so we're looking at um, putting money in a fund where we will invest in the community and they just pay us back as they save money on their energy bills. And with um, the costs going up the way they are, there's a real um, proposition there. Um, and so we've already seen quite a few slides on what will happen and, um, and the need for, for jobs. And, you know, when we talk about displacement, we have just gone through an incredible shock with the pandemic. Uh, and I think that there's opportunities to uh, use local authorities, as Kara has said, to create the training and get people skilled up and working in the industry. It's super important that we get people excited about uh, this transition that is needs to happen and how they can play a role in, in transforming our nation. And I think in terms of energy um, and, and the transition, this country has always been an international leader. We can set the tone for the rest of the world. I think it's really a possibility. Um, and so I will, <laughs> I will uh, wind up there. Um, these are my contact details. If you uh, want to know uh, anything about uh, what we're doing in, in the community. I, I would suggest looking at our website because we do a lot of fuel poverty work. Um, and, and I will just say that one thing about local authorities. I think there is a place for local authorities in terms of promoting training, um, but if we look at local authorities in terms of driving the transition, they're not properly, they're not commercially aware. I don't think that they're going to be uh, spending the money in the, in the wisest way. And also they're not used to collaborating. They are not by nature collaborators. They work in silos. And we don't even work with our local authority. We only do all their fuel poverty work because we can do it cheaper than them. Um, and so they get real value for money. Uh, but in terms of rolling out policies, uh, I, I have real um, concerns about all the money, say, for the local authority delivery programs and all the money going to local authorities and then not being spent efficiently and because they won't be working with the community energy groups. Um, and so thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go, don't go. I'm going to invite all of my speakers back up to the stage now so that we can have a panel discussion and my goodness me we have quite a lot of questions in here and certainly not enough time to go through all of them but and do, can we get Karen back as well will we oh fantastic <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> um so I mean what a what an amazing session and I do think that there was some 
some interesting themes that were touched on by all the presentations and certainly looking across some of the questions that we've had in, there seem to be a number of, a number of themes coming through, one of which is emerging around this idea of local and scale and um, you know how important geography is, the potential benefits of local pathways. Um, you know, do we need local economic strategies? What scale does this need to happen at? And, and really, what are the roles for national government, local government, the wider industry, community energy, and, and how do we see all of that working together and coming together? Because evidently, there's a lot of different actors involved in this space. So that's quite a broad range of questions that I'd like to to put to the panel, really, to look at how do we start to think about. Oh, Whose phone is this? Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> I was just buzzing about it. Right <laughs> um, so really, yeah. So, so what do what do um, do we see as the the right scale for delivering this local, regional, combined authority? Um, and how do we see national and local working together? And so, I don't know if there's anybody that particularly wants to start on that. You look like you're nodding. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, really, as per uh, my presentation, I think we do definitely see a strong uh, role for local authorities. I think uh, you see combined authorities um, probably taking a lead because they have those devolution powers. You know, they have uh, economy is within that uh, their uh, devolved powers, and they have a certain amount of additional funding uh, to deal with that. So, so they're tending to take the lead. Obviously, with the, the new white paper, um, the levelling up white paper, we're expecting more uh, devolution. So we're going to have county deals uh, coming. And I would see that kind of whole skills development um, uh, and uh, local economic development being a, a very key part of those county deals. But they can only do so much without the right national government policy. Uh, because they need funding to do their work, they need long-term certainty because otherwise employers and colleges are not going to get involved. So it really has to be uh, a partnership between local and national. Thank you. Anyone else from the panel want to come in? Yeah, well I don't think that local authority... So it, there's 280 community energy groups in the country. A lot of these groups are doing highly innovative projects now to look at how we're going to transform the energy industry. If, if we look at local authorities and projects that they've deployed, uh, let's just take an example of heat decarbonization in Swaffham Prior. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that heat network, but if you look at the spend um, to create a heat network in, in Swaffham Prior, it was a highly innovative project, but it costs, I believe, about 15 million pounds to establish a heat network for about 300 residents. So that's obvious that the cost per resident is not economic. Uh, and so I, I really think that we need to look at how we're spending funding um, and, and where that money is being deployed. Um, and the reason why local authorities are getting all the money because it's, it's much easier for national government to just give it to a local authority. Well, why are we looking for the easiest route? Why aren't we looking for the most effective route? Can I just say that I would definitely agree that community groups have to be part of that and I think local, I would agree with you what you said in your presentation that local authorities have to get better at working beyond their own remit and engaging with community groups partly because they don't have the capacity themselves to deliver right. so they need to have be working with communities particularly if you're trying to do things like influencing retrofit take up you yeah. have got to be working with your communities mm -hmm. so so yes i think we're in, in more agreement than it appears I mean, I want to bring this up as well to talk about the, the national level and how we see, you know, because there's what, one thing to think about how local authorities work with community groups and bringing that together. You know, one of, one of the questions come in around how we, how we scale this up uh, with under-resourced or uncooperative local authorities. But I also want to think about, you know, reflecting right back to the start um, with Karen talk, looking at some of the challenges around, um, you know, the need to take that kind of whole sector and whole economy approach and, and could that be harder at, you know if you're just looking at those local levels so I particularly want to bring in um, you know Karen and Richard how do you see this happening in terms of like the the role for national government working with local government and perhaps the wider industry as well and um, so Karen maybe if I come to you first yeah I mean I think it's, I mean, it's really interesting what Kyle and Cara were seeing there I mean I think one thing is that 
you know, Richard and I have both looked at, you know, kind of job creation and that, and you know, that that's a national level picture, and you have to have that, especially to understand some of the constraint issues and things. But, you know, one thing that, that, that resonated, it was actually in Kyla's presentation, when, when we did work with the Scottish Government a number of years ago when the Energy Efficiency Roadmap came out, and you're looking at things like job creation benefits, they're not tangible to people at a local level. And I remember one of the questions come up at one of the Scottish Government's engagement, public engagement sessions, like people who live in Aberdeen saying, well, what interest is it to us if jobs are being created in Glasgow? You know, that's not helping our local economy. And there's difficulties then in, in us actually being able, you know, people in Aberdeen actually being able to get a project, you know. And so I, I think it, it really matters at all levels, you know, at local level, that's where you you know you need to get over. As Kyla was saying, some of the problems about the, the non-financial barriers from actually getting energy efficiency projects. People say we don't want the disruption and things. That needs to come through at local level. When you're looking at some of the, what are some of the wider benefits if people do value them, they will benefit. You know, get the kind of regard jobs being created at a local level as being more important. So there's just this inevitable. Everything that you try to look at at a national level, you need to translate through to the local level. But at the same time, you know, to be able to get things going at a local level, if the national framework is not in place, it's not going to happen. So it's kind of, it's not an either or, they're inexorably linked. But that brings a real policy challenge because there is a kind of, you know, we hear it in parliamentary questions all the time, oh, that's a local authority responsibility so it's not getting this so we really need that joined up thinking at, across the different levels of government so that you're really resonating with what people need and what people value so uh, i know you're rushing to jump back in on that Kayla. What? yeah i mean what was beautiful about karen's presentation is she showed how uh, energy efficiency creates the most jobs if we really want to drive economic growth we, we should be looking at an energy efficiency as the key driver. If we, if we make 19 million homes energy efficient, that's the equivalent of six nuclear power plants. And that can happen a lot quicker and with a lot more benefit to the local economy. Um, in, in Karen's beautiful uh, chart there, she showed there was only like 30,000 jobs created by nuclear, whereas this, uh, this probably uh, three or four times the number of jobs that can be created by running energy efficiency programs. And the other elephant in the room is that when you improve the energy efficiency of your home, you are improving the value because you're retaining more heat, which has a future value because you are, your heating costs are less over time. Um, so it's really important. And you're making people better off. You know, so that you know that was where we we're getting our long-term gains. Is people are spending less on energy, so they've got more disposable income. But I think the other crucial thing at the moment, you know, I mean, I, I alluded to it, is that you know the, the, the circumstances that people are finding themselves in now. We need to be more resilient to future price shocks in energy. So if you make people energy efficient, they get that resilience. So there's there's so many benefits come out of doing it. But the challenge is, it's millions of households, but much. You know, you're, you're right then to focus the attention. You need to do lots of things, but to really the focus the attention, energy efficiency is just so important from so many perspectives and in, in so many ways. Do you want to jump in, Richard? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, there is a concept for uh, local area energy planning um, as, as well that would involve not just local councils, but also multiple actors in, 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 in local areas. But, um, there isn't a dominant model yet that has been adopted for this um, in, in, in England particularly. So that is, that is a gap and, and, and also national government needs to provide a framework for, um, to, to support the design of those local area energy plans. And, and more generally then, yeah, there really does need to be a sort of national strategy for um, developing skills and supply chains for, for um, achieving, achieving net zero. Um, and the sort of national level mapping of, 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 of what the distribution will be in terms of, sort of jobs gained or lost at the regional and local levels working with um, lo local councils. So there needs to be that communication between national and local. And we've heard from the other presentation that there's lots of good stuff go going on in pockets locally, but we, we really need that sort of national strong direction of travel and leadership. Fantastic. Thank 
you. So I'm going to jump to the other kind of theme of some of the questions coming through, which is about time. Sounds like there's a party going on somewhere outside of this room. <laughs> um, so we've got two questions in here that I think are very, very highly related about, you know, what's needed and when. So the first question is around, you know, are there different policies that we should be looking at pursuing in the short term versus the long term to, to address some of the concerns and issues raised around, you know, availability and development of skilled workers? And, and a very related question, you know, if we are going to try and look at, um, you know, the green energy transition to reduce unemployment and um, displace kind of low wage service sector jobs, what training and skills infrastructure do we need to have in place and when? So, you know, th this is a really big picture challenge that, that's been laid out and clearly it's not going to change overnight. So, so where are those current you know, short-term pressing priorities versus the, the longer term? Um, do any of the panellists want to jump in on that? I mean, I can make a yep. start. Um, I mean, I think as we've all said, the, there's a, a real urgent uh, short-term need to boost the construction workforce. And if we want sort of short-term impact, it's going to be about upskilling uh, existing workers. Uh, so whether that's uh, you know, uh, uh, plumbers in, uh, in, in low carbon heating uh, or existing builders in retrofit technology. So any initiatives that are upskilling the existing workforce are going to give the best short-term effort. Uh, but ultimately, we need to be looking at, at bringing new people into the industry because of that ageing workforce issue. So yes, we do need to be looking at apprenticeships and you know, incentivising uh, people at school now to go into the sector. So kind of, we need a, a multi-pronged approach. Yeah. Um, also, we need to create the demand in the market. So there needs to be work for these people once they get skilled. And this is where community energy groups come in, um, is that we can create um, customers f and, and work for the uh, firms. So they're not going to take on apprentices unless they get more work. Mm -hmm. And this has been part of the problem, is that they don't see the demand coming down the road. And so there has to be a real concentrated effort to create that demand in the market by working in communities and then um, the job creation will come because if they've got a lot of orders, they're going to have to fulfill those. Mm -hmm. and in, 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 in the medium term, another need identified in various studies is that um, jobs, jobs in, say, construction and installation of, 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 of renewables tend to be um, contract-based and sort of temporary in nature, so the job security is, is, is not good for many of those kinds of jobs. So actually addressing that issue um, is important because otherwise, you know, it, it, it might have negative implications for people looking to move into those sectors it, um, if they are worried about what their long-term um, career prospects might be. Mm -hmm. And, and definitely a piece of work Rachel and I actually did, um, which wasn't explicitly about jobs, but more about just transition in general. That was a concern that was really raised, like the shift from, um, you know, unionised jobs through to something where you're often in an SME without that that security. I mean, Karen, do you have any any thoughts on this one? From what oh, well, all three of my colleagues and, and, and from what you've just said as well, Becky, is that it takes us back to this this policy commitment. I mean, as I said, when we looked at the 15-year energy efficiency program, that that was the first thing that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the length of the jobs; it was about the commitment from policy being there, so that there is a, a clear direction. First of all, for firms to allocate their capital, but it also applies in the labour force. You know, you, you've you know we've held various events where particularly you know, workers who are already in the oil and gas industry, they need to have certainty that there is going to be a career path there. You know, and households need to, you know, people are worried, why would I replace my gas boiler now with a heat pump when I don't know what direction all of this is going in? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, across the piece you've got this, people and you know who've got various roles in this just not being convinced that this is a even though we've got the, the net zero commitments for 2050, you know, the, but net zero is about emissions reduction. It's not, you know, I, I wonder now if we need to shift focus a little bit in terms of what it is you're actually wanting to do with the economy, because 
I think people are worried, well, what if you shift off that net zero emissions reduction ambition, you know, for the size of the country or, you know, the right of the, you know, the, the, the kind of right argument about why, whether a small country like us should be doing things. There's too much uncertainty and that's why, you know, kind of, you know, when we wrote the Green Growth Discussion Paper and things like you're trying to get this conversation on to the future economy. Will that bring more policy commitment if they're talking about a long term economic strategy? Because that's the problem. There's just too much uncertainty to get the supply and demand in place for the things that you need to do and for people who are in the labour force to take, you know, because it is a big jump if you're going to change your job, you know, you're going to change your career and things like that. And so I, I think that's what's missing. And it's been said already in the session is that that's where the real responsibility lies in national government is putting this clear commitment into place. And I know that's difficult when you get four year parliamentary terms, mm -hmm. and the next government can come in and overturn it. But somehow or other, we've, we've got to get in place that this is the way that we are committed to going forward. We did it with things like digitalization. You know, there was a clear commitment, that's the path we were going in. Why did we do that? Well, we recognised that digitalisation was good for us. So that, that, to me, is still the overarching public policy problem. How are we going to get and have people confident in this is, this is the direction that we're going in so that people can, in a variety of different ways, can make the changes that need to be made? Can I just add one thing? Um, you, you mentioned in your question at the start about um, service sector jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that these, jo these jobs are not going to just be sort of installation jobs. Their customer service is actually going to be a really important aspect of it and actually bringing people with you. You see, the Committee of Climate Change acknowledged in the sixth carbon budget. A lot of these changes now are not going to be about technology, it's going to be about adoption of technology and, and behaviour. And for that, you need good customer service. You need to you know, work with your resident as you're installing their, their, their home. Um, you need to think, you know, dietary changes, how, how are we going to get those to, to happen? So, so it's really thinking quite broadly and not just about those kind of traditional installation roles. Definitely. So there's one other thing I want to touch on in, in the two minutes we have left, and it hasn't come up in the questions, but it came up in, in a couple of the presentations, and this is around diversity. And I have to say, I mean, I, I know this is an issue for the sector, but I was really shocked, Richard, in the, the numbers that you had in your presentation, just about the sheer lack of diversity that we're seeing. And considering that this session is about looking forward and what we need to do, perhaps I, ha I haven't prepared anyone for this question, but what... What do we need to do to, to address that as, as we start to embark on this big, uh, this big shift towards greener jobs? Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so last week I was, uh, as part of the Ashton Awards, we go and visit organisations. I was up in Scotland, um, uh, in, in Argyll, and uh, looking at an organisation that remanufactures wind turbine parts. And one of their uh, new electrical engineers is a uh, guy from London, I think originally of um, African heritage, who had worked um, in hospitality uh, as a waiter uh, in Edinburgh first. He decided to, he was really interested in renewables and he uh, did an electrical engineering degree through the Open University, uh, specialising in renewables. And for the last year, he's been working um, on the electrical side of refurbishing uh, wind turbine parts. Uh, I very much hope Ashton will be telling his story widely and loudly and putting people, getting people like that to go in and speaking to schools because pe people from diverse backgrounds need to see people that look like them. Mm -hmm. So about telling the stories that this can happen and that there are opportunities there. Kayla, has this been your experience working in the local community about engaging diversely? Well, Brighton is <laughs> it's not the most diverse uh, city in the, in the UK, but um, um, I, I would say the only thing that I try and do is in, encourage people into into the industry through through passion, and also being a, a woman in the energy industry is quite unusual. I would I would think that there's probably about 85% of the industry is male. Um, and so just by running this organization and doing it differently, I think attracts a, a lot of um, women to, to the industry. Um, BESCO itself has perfectly diverse um, board, well, as, as much as we can. We don't have any people of color, unfortunately, but uh, I, I would love to hi hire someone if they, they came to me.
Um, well, I, I actually see that we are at time and <laughs> I hear people going past for coffee and I don't want to be what stands between you and that. So can I just please ask you to join with me in thanking all of our panelists uh, for an amazing session. Lots of resources that they shared with you that you can access online through all of their websites. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you.